It fell upon a midsummer's eve, when Cormac, high king of Ireland, held court at Tara, that there came to that place and time a radiant youth with a branch from a sacred fairy tree upon which nine red apples grew. Now such were the properties of that branch, that whenever and wherever it was shaken, those nine red apples would sing. Strange, you may say, yet stranger by far than this, was the effect that singing had upon those who chanced to hear it. For instantly, they would forget all pain and sorrow, even the faint-hearted, the broken-spirited, and those half-crazed and wild with madness would be soothed by this magical song and relieved, while ever it lasted, of all suffering and cause for despair. Well, soon Cormac heard tell of this wonder, and he sought out the youth, saying, What would you ask in exchange for that fairy branch, with the nine red apples which sing so sweet? Would you give me whatever I ask, no matter how high or low? Aye, said Cormac, whatever you ask. And with that, the two men shook hands, whereupon the youth claimed Cormac's own fair queen and two small babes. Oh, heavy of heart was Cormac when he learned the price of that fairy branch, and he let out a cry of pain which echoed through the whole of Ireland and everyone who heard it fell to their knees and wept. But Cormac then shook the fairy branch, and the bitter tears of grief ceased to flow, and his own fair queen left Tara that day without a trace of sorrow. For a whole year, Cormac soothed his people with the music of sweet forgetfulness which flowed from the fruit of that sacred fairy tree. But when next midsummer came around, he set the branch aside, allowing all memory of loss to stir once more and to rise, coursing full-blooded through their hearts. He then called his able men to arms and led them in quest of their lost queen and heirs deep into the wild and desolate plains which stretched out beyond Tara's walls. Soon a dark magical mist rained down upon them, and Cormac, who had been riding ahead, very quickly found himself alone. And though he called out, imploring his men to ride on without fear, not a word came back in reply. And that was when he knew beyond all shade and shadow of doubt, that he had entered the enchanted border realms of fairy. And as this knowing awakened within him, the dark magical mist parted and drew back in rich, dew-filled folds, opening upon an unseen stage revealing, as they parted and departed, a dreamscape, 
Lush green and heady scented, with blossoms and blooms, with unknown suns and moons, with rays and shards from silver stars, shimmering within a mulberry-hued sky. Now as he stood there, in that magical portal into the beyond, Cormac gradually became aware of a presence at his side. There was nothing to see, nothing to hear, yet whoever or whatever it was pulled and tugged at his arm with an urgency that could not be denied. Cormac's heart pounded, his mind swam, the hair on the back of his neck bristled and stood on end. Yet he stepped forward nevertheless, and as he did so, a luminous silver pathway appeared at his feet and unwound like silver thread, weaving its way through endless twists and turns, deep into the fabric of the mysterious terrain ahead. Now after he had travelled far along this path, without rest nor sleep, nor morsel to eat, he came to a house overcast by a dark shadow. A group of men with bowed heads and stooped backs were busy thatching the roof with the feathers from tiny fledgling birds which lay slain and discarded on the ground below. Now to Carmack, their work seemed utterly without sense, for no sooner had the feathers been plucked and laid in place, than they were lifted by the breeze and blown away. And so, even though the men worked vigorously, they made no progress at all. For a long time, Cormac looked on, unable to comprehend, and he would have stepped forward to reason with those men, though as the words of helpful advice began to form in his mind, the unseen hand tugged at his sleeve, pulling him back onto the shimmering silver path and far, far away from that shadowy place to a sparse wood where a shivering man was trying to kindle a fire with a single log. As before, Cormac watched for some time, but again he could make no sense of what he saw. For no sooner had the flames caught than the shivering man jumped up and ran off in search of another log. And by the time he returned, the first had burned to a cinder. And so, even though he worked without rest, he never once felt the warmth of the many, many fires he made. Now looking on at this tragic scene, Cormac was greatly drawn to intervene, though again the unseen hand tugged at his sleeve, pulling him back onto the shimmering silver path, and far, far away from that sparse wood, to the banks of an emerald green ocean 
where a gatehouse, intricately fashioned from coral shells and deep sea pearls, stood motionless upon the shifting sand twixt the land and the sea. And as Cormac approached, in staggered, faltering steps across those quickening sands, where the silver path dipped low beneath his feet, where many a traveller to oblivion sinks through the restlessly roaming grains, where naught but faith and faith alone upholds the seeker's steps, where all true hearts must surely pass to the brink of the emerald sea. Twas then, and only then, dear friends, that a far away voice called out Lilting with the ebb and flow of the waves, a distant harpist cried, Throw back the gates to the salty sea, where the wearied traveller comes, and let him now sail the ferry boat. In the name of Mananan Maclear. Slowly now, so slowly now, those pearl-strewn gates swung open, and the unseen hand, unfelt for some time, seized and pushed Cormac forward. And indeed, tis true, a fairy boat stood, docked and moored and waiting, and the green sea lapped and licked at the hull, and swished and swirled and rocked her, to and fro, with the rhythm of the tide, and the winds now ripe for the sailing, and the seabirds cried to the skies above, as Cormac stepped aboard. Then a myriad of fairy kind appeared with thought to help him, to lift above the anchored wheel from its lodging in the deep sea bed, and to hoist the sails, and to steer Cormac's course. In the name of Mananan Maclear. his fairy crew at last spied land. First had come the cry from the foremost mast, down the rigging to the helm, when then as one the fairies had cried, Behold those blessed isles, and behold the dwelling of Mananan Maclear, keeper of the emerald seas.
But suddenly, and strangely now, Cormac found himself alone on dry land. Night had fallen, and a cold wind stirred and rustled through the trees. The smell of wood smoke filtered toward him, and away ahead, light flickered at the window of a simple cottage. Now within this place, as Cormac soon saw as he approached and peered in, sat a wizened, white-haired and bearded man with a golden harp upon his knee. By his side, an old woman sat spinning, and a generous winter fire crackled and spat and glowed in the hearth. Both were clad in many-hued robes, which shimmered like silk in the firelight. And as Cormac looked on, as they in turn looked into the flames, it was as if all the ages of time rippled like waves across their faces, from youth to prime to great old age and even ancient age at times it seemed. For a long while he watched, unable to understand. Though as he stood there, shivering with cold and weary from his travels, the name of Mananan MacLear rang out in his mind, clear as a bell, and repeating itself over and over. And he thought of Tara, of his home, of his own lost queen and two small babes. And it was then, as these thoughts filled him, that the door of the cottage opened, and the white-haired and bearded man invited him in. Well, a place was swiftly made for him beside the fire, and the young woman, for that was how she now appeared, bathed his feet, gave him fresh robes, and combed his hair. The old man looked on silently till she was done, and then, for a long while, all three stared into the flames. Though by and by a knock came to the door, and a man with an axe came into the room, with a pig following on behind him. It is time to eat, said the old man, and instantly the man with the axe killed the pig and put it on a spit above the fire ready to roast. Cormac stood up eagerly to turn the spit, for he was famished beyond belief, but it would not shift nor move. It is impossible to turn the spit, the old man then said, until a true story be told. Hi, and for each quarter of the meat, this same rule applies. I shall begin then, said the man with the axe, and he took a place beside the fire and began. One day, as I was out walking, I spied the finest herd of cattle you ever did see, roaming and grazing freely through the fields. Well, I quickly gathered them together and returned them in all good faith to a nearby cattle pound. 
But then their owner appeared to me, saying that he would reward me greatly if only I would set them free again. So, strange as it seemed, I set them all loose, and in return he gave to me a pig and an axe, saying, Every night you will kill the pig with this axe, but every morning the pig will live again as whole as ever she was. And I tell you now, he continued, as he cleaned the stains from the blade, that this is the self-same axe, and this is the self-same pig that you see before you on the spit. Well now, said the old man, grinning from ear to ear, that is without doubt a true tale. And he looked at Cormac then, and motioned for him to turn the spit, which he did, and a quarter of the meat cooked. Well, the young woman then took on a matronly appearance, rearranged her aprons, which Cormac had not seen before, and began. One day we went out to plough the fields, but when we got there we found them already ploughed and harrowed and sown with wheat as well. And when it was time for the reaping we went out again, but we found our wheat already cut and stacked in the fields. And a few days after that, when we went to fetch it in, we found it already secure and dry in the barn. But even more than this, she went on with a broad smile, we have eaten that wheat every day since, and it never grows any the less, and it never grows any the older. True enough whispered the old man, true as it's told. And as he spoke, Cormac turned the spit, and the second quarter of the meat cooked. I shall tell the third tale myself now, the old man went on, of a place not so very far away from here, to those who know the way. A place where the sun shines all the year through, and where a beautiful fountain stands at its exact center. Now from this fountain flow five clear streams, Nine hazel trees surround it, each shedding nuts into the water below to feed the five salmon who live there. Aye, and all around, people are forever singing and dancing, and nowhere is there any sign of age or decay. Cormac turned the spit once more, and the third quarter of the meat cooked to perfection. Now it is your turn, the old man said to Cormac. Then we shall eat our fill. I am no storyteller, Cormac began. Though I do have a tale to tell, Of my own fair queen, Lost to another worldly rogue, And of my two small babes, Carried far away from their home. In Tara we lived, Not so long ago, And I search, yet do not find, and my heart grows cold. 
And as Cormac told his sorrowful tale, tears welled in his eyes, though the spit turned gently round, and the last quarter of the meat cooked. And at that same time, a small door beside the fireplace creaked and swung open into a simple candlelit chamber, where to Cormac's great joy, surprise and heart's relief, sat the lost Queen of Tara, his own true love, with their two small babes suckling at her breast. Oh, he was overwhelmed now, and rightly so, for who would ever have thought it? Well, they all embraced and kissed and smiled and hugged as never before. But when at last Cormac turned questioningly to the old man, he was nowhere to be seen, though sitting in his place was none other than the same radiant youth whom once he had met within Tara's walls. I, Carmack, the young man began softly. It was I who gave you the fairy branch, and I who carried away your queen and babes, for I am Mananan MacLear, keeper of the emerald seas and lord of fairy, and I have lured you here so that you may see for yourself the wonders of this mythical place with which you are forever entwined. And then Mananan MacLear, in his own true and radiant form, carved and served the meat. And when they had eaten their fill, he brought forth from his girdle a shimmering silver cup, the likeness of which no man had seen before. And he offered it to Cormac, saying, Kneel now, High King of Ireland, drink from this ancient cup and share the mystery of life. sweet, so sweet like a song, and light, light streaming, pouring, bathing, cleansing, and he was renewed then, and born, I, born into the wisdom of kings. Now no one can say more than this. Though it is remembered that when at last the light faded, a resting place was prepared for Cormac and his kin, and Mananan MacLear took up his golden harp and lulled those mortals into the realm of dreams. And it was there that they made their return journey. Cross the Emerald Sea, cross the shifting sands and strange borderlands. But it was in Tara that they awoke, with the shimmering silver cup and fairy branch beside them. It was Midsummer's Day, and some say no time had passed at all.